Welcome to Fruity Knitting. I'm Fiona. And I'm Andrea. And this is episode 121. So Fruity Knitting is a 90-minute program bringing you knitting inspiration from around the world, as well as extra snippets of travel, history and storytelling that we hope adds joy to your life and brings a smile to your face. We're celebrating another birthday today, and this time it's Andrea's. Yes. Happy birthday. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> Now, don't worry, it's not turning into a drinking show. This is non-alcoholic bubbly. But we also need to celebrate Fiona's last session on the Fruity Knitting Couch because I'm flying back to Germany on the 1st of May. And Fiona has been such a wonderful co-host and we're all going to miss her so much. So cheers to you too. Cheers. <laughs> and there is a lot of tragic and devastating news happening at the moment, which does weigh very heavily on us all. And as many of you will remember, this week is the anniversary of Andrew's death, which weighs really heavily on me. I miss him every single minute of the day. But we do need to think of all the good things in our lives. So we invite you to join us we invite you again, just like we did last time, to join us with your favourite beverage. And of course, it doesn't have to be alcoholic, just to celebrate and be grateful for all the good things that are happening in our lives. So cheers. Cheers. And hopefully this episode will bring you some joyful respite and even a couple of laughs. <laughs>, <laughs> so let me tell you about our program today. Our feature interview is with the UK knitwear designer Sarah Hatton, who you may recognise as being one of the main Rowan designers over the last few years. So Sarah is a professionally trained knitwear designer and her output is truly prolific. She did well over 1,000 designs for the yarn company Serda before joining the design team at Rowan and since then she's done hundreds of designs for Rowan. So I think you'll really enjoy Sarah. She's very personable and knowledgeable and she's also a great technician because she received this really thorough old school technical training from Serda, which I found totally fascinating to listen to. And then for Knitters of the World, we're going to Denmark to meet Stephanie Rasmussen. And Stephanie describes herself as a vintage fashion and historical costume nerd. And she knits beautiful vintage garments to go with her homemade vintage clothes. And because this is truly turning into a family show, when I recently visited my mum in Canberra, I took her to the Australian National Botanical Gardens with a suitcase of her own hand knits and I convinced her to model them for you in amongst the, nat the native Australian flora. <laughs> We're going to playfully explore some colour theory and we both have updates on our knitting in Under Construction. Yeah. So we'll head straight there with Andrea and her primrose. Okay, so... This is the project that I first showed you last, last episode. So it's my most recent project. It's a design by Marie Wallen. And just to remind you what it's going to look like when I finally finish it, here's a picture of it. So it's called Primrose and it uses Marie's British Breeds yarn in 14 colours, which you can buy together with the pattern in a kit from her website. And it's knitted bottom up in the round with a circular yoke. So this is what I've done so far. Here it is. Looking good and elaborate. Mm. So you have to knit both sleeves and the body up to the armholes before joining them all together and then you keep knitting in the round for the yoke. And when I had all three sections on the needles together, I had 435 stitches on my needle, which doesn't wow. sound like, I know, it sounds like a lot for us, but if you're a shawl knitter, you can sometimes have 500 stitches. That's one of the reasons why I don't like knitting shawls. <laughs> okay, so you might remember that in the last episode, I was worried that the yoke was going to be too deep. So my plan was to take the first band of patterning that's in the yoke and put it down into the body and into the sleeves and join the sleeves to the body above that band of patterning. Well I did do that and we're talking about this blue band of patterning here. So I put that down into the body and then I tried it on and I didn't like the results. I felt like that the, the body was too long and this beautiful um, stripy ribbing here was sitting on my hips and I actually just want it to be directly on my waist so it has that kind of cropped vintagey look to it. Very nice. Yes, so I unpicked it and I joined the sleeves to the body where the pattern tells you to 
and put this beautiful band of blue patterning up in the yoke where it belongs. And then I knitted further. Now, I tried it on for the first time last night and I nearly cried because <laughs> there's actually too much material across here in the shoulders for me. So I'm gonna to have to unpick it all again. What I would normally do at home is get one of my other yoked jumpers and have it nearby and then every now and again just take this jumper and lie it over the top and just make mm. sure that I'm doing I'm roughly knitting the same shape and I'm not doing anything crazy but I've Clever. been yeah so I've been living out of a suitcase for the last three months and I've only got summer clothes so I didn't get the opportunity to do that and last episode I told you that the small was too small and the medium was going to be too big and I was aiming for something dead down the center of that so my plan now if you can hold it again is to rip right down to the bottom of the blue again knit this on a smaller size needle and this this blue patterning here does have a 24 stitch pattern to it but all the patterns above it are only 12 stitch patterns so I can actually get rid of a lot of stitches on this top couple of rows of plain knitting here in the blue so that's what my plan is I'll knit here on a smaller needle get rid of more stitches than the pattern says and and decrease just to get rid of some of the material well Andrew did always say that you knitted your jumpers twice I know I know because I once had bragged well I didn't brag but I just said that I get totally bored of knitting a design you would never knit one twice exactly but that's probably because I knit it multiple times as I'm knitting the first one <laughs> Anyway, so I'm, I've put it on two needles so I can try it on and show you what it looks like. So here we go. I feel like I'm in some form of a historical costume from the 1700s. Mary Antoinette. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> with my puff sleeves underneath. So you probably can't see this directly, but there is... Whoops, I'm sure I've just... Oh, no, it's okay. Yeah, I thought I'd drop some, some stitches, but there is too much material here and here, so I'm going to have to get, I'm rather fine around the shoulders, I think. So. Alternatively, you could save yourself a lot of work and gift it to me. <laughs> it probably would suit you, actually, and I mean, it would definitely suit you, but it probably would fit you, because this is the, this is the area. Madeline's actually just a little bit bigger than me in this area as yeah. well. So, but. I got first dibs, Madeline. <laughs> <laughs> so there we go that's the quickest update on my primrose because I think Fiona's prepared something rather involved but before we go on into that I just want to give you a very quick close-up look at this beautiful patterning with all the beautiful heathered colors seeing as it's Andrea's birthday and we all know how much she loves her clothes yes <laughs> I thought it would be fun to play a little dress up let me explain what I mean so as knitters, we're very aware of the important role that colour plays in our world, and it's talked about a lot on this show. Back in one of the golden oldie episodes of Fruity Knitting, Andrea mentions the 1970s classic book, Colour Me Beautiful, which she and every other teenage girl of the 80s discovered on their mother's bookshelf and would regularly peruse the contents of its pages. Andrea, why don't you give us a little intro into the theory behind the book? Okay, so the Colour Me Beautiful book is a colour analysis theory that says you can find the palette of colours that best suits you within the four seasons of summer, winter, autumn and spring. Now, I know most of you have heard of this theory in some form or another, and some of you might even be a little bit fed up with it. The title of the book is a little bit old-fashioned, but just bear with us because I think we're just going to have some fun. So... Summers and winters have cool colours, autumns and springs have warm colours. Now this is where it can first get a little bit confusing because from an artist's perspective the colour red is considered to be warm but um, in the theory of, in the Colour Me Beautiful theory you can have a warm red or a cool red. In fact you can have a warm and cool version of almost any colour and how you define it is cool based colours won't have either gold orange or rust as an undertone instead they'll all have a blue undertone and typically there are lots of shades of pinks and blues and mauves and greeny blues and greeny greys bluey blues <laughs> and bluey blues whereas warm based colors will all have either a gold orange or rust undertone to them 
So coming back to the color red, you can have a red with a blue undertone like a cherry red and that's considered to be a cool red or you can have an orangey red or a rusty red which is a warm red. On top of that, both groups have clear bright versions of their colors and muted versions of their colors. So a clear color, it, um, it becomes lighter when you add white to it and darker when you add black to it. So it's staying true and clear to itself, whereas muted colors will all have a wash of gray through them, which makes them muted, but in my opinion, also makes them a little bit more interesting or more sophisticated. And a lot of vintage colors will have a wash of gray through them. So coming back to the four seasons, winters will have cool colors that are clear and bright and very high contrast, whereas summers will have cool colors that are muted and pretty much lay in the mid-range of, of um, color depth. Autumns will have warm colors that are deep and muted and springs will have warm colors that are clear and bright. So that's the Color Me Beautiful theory in a nutshell. I thought we should all start at least on the same page before you run off with this wherever you're going. That was a big <laughs> nutshell. It was a big <laughs> nutshell. So back when Andrea was 13, <clears throat> mum swiftly diagnosed her as an autumn yes. because of her strawberry blonde locks, her turquoise eyes and her creamy coloured skin with its sprinkling of golden freckles. Actually, I had a face full of freckles and I had short red hair and I was a typical Anne of Green Gables. I hated being called carrots and I would have loved mousy brown hair, anything but red hair. Anyway, when mum diagnosed me as an autumn, I promptly burst into tears because the, the autumn palette does have a lot of browns and olives and murky mustards. And at the time, I thought they were such ugly colours. <laughs> well, our older sister, Michaela, who you've all met, she was labelled as a summer because of her light ash brown hair and her cool blue eyes and her rose <clears throat> undertoned skin. Now, Many of us long-term viewers have been very well educated <laughs> on autumn and their best colours thanks to Andrea and now Madeline's extensive collection of hand knits which are dominated by the colours of green and orange and rusty browns and we have explored winter through Andrew with his lovely dark locks and his dark blue eyes and his ivory skin. Andrea would insist on only knitting for Andrew with cool and deep colours to best complement his palette. Right. But never before have we really truly explored summer until now or spring unless Jack the Poodle counts. No, I think he's in autumn. <laughs> well, I somewhat reluctantly <clears throat> fall into the category of summer because of my naturally ashen hair, my mid-blue eyes and my blue undertone skin, which makes me the perfect candidate for the girly colours of lavender, baby pink and baby blue. Well, you do look great in them. As we can see here in my new birthday dress. Yes. Thank you, Andrea. My bobbly powder blue cardigan yeah. and my new cabling project. Yep, you look stunning in all of those colours. Well, thanks. But uh, when I was younger, I could not stand these girly colours and mum would insist on putting me in dusty pinks and saying oh that's such your color and <laughs> now that I've matured and have four daughters of my own I've learned to embrace these girly colors but I do have a preference for the brighter warmer colors of spring now I should warn you that Andrea is starting to move in and claim spring as being her season as well as autumn <laughs> I've got her on record as saying I think I'm becoming a spring and backing it up with some <laughs> pop theory that as autumns get older, they look better in the lighter, brighter tones of spring. I don't know why I agreed to have you on the couch with me. <laughs> now, in our family, Andrea is very well known for her habit of going through our wardrobes and claiming that all of our clothes are in her colours. I'm talking all four seasons, <laughs> excluding grey and baby pink. Yes. And when I colors. chime in yeah. and eagerly agree that I also look pretty good in certain spring colours, the standard response is, no, you're a summer. <laughs> That's my prerogative. I'm the older sister. <laughs> Something doesn't compute here. How come our Andrea is the only girl in the world to jump outside of her seasonal box? Is she an enigma? Or could this in fact be a more covert and sinister strain of dragon sickness creeping in? <laughs> Andrea, I think we need a new hashtag. Yes. Colour me dragon. <laughs> Look, I don't know that that is true, but 
In my defense, what's really funny is during my recent stay with mum, she actually said that I could wear some summer colors. In fact, she she convinced me to buy this new color here for my next project. Which Clearly I my color. Yeah, I would have <laughs> thought of this as a summer color. I don't know if it comes up on the on the camera, but it's sort of got a it's a cream with a rose tint to it. It's a very sophisticated colour. Actually, I think of it as a boring neutral. But mum did convince me that I needed more neutrals in my wardrobe and I can't just knit bright colours. And I am a good girl and I do do what I'm told. <laughs> and mother knows best. Listen to your mumsy. That's what Madeline sings to me. <laughs> oh, she's a good girl. <laughs> now, the book does clearly state that you are either a warm or a cool undertoned person but I've purchased the most recent version for research purpose purposes and <laughs> very deep within the fine print is the disclosure that it is in fact possible to switch from a warm to a cool, but in order for this to happen, two very extraordinary circumstances must first occur. So okay. grab your champagne. Okay. Number one, you must have recently celebrated your 50th birthday. Oh, well, 52 <laughs> and number two, your hair must have turned at least 50% silver, which it clearly hasn't. Am I meant to celebrate that or not? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, I think it's high time that we put this Colour Me Beautiful theory to the test once and for all to see whether it holds up against our lovely Andrea or whether she blows this 50-year-old colour analysis system right out of the water. Okay, let's go. Well, in order to do so, we must first determine whether she truly is a cool or a warm undertone person. You might see that we've raided the children's uh, makeup cupboard and we've got a whole lot of clothes here with colours. Dress up cupboard. <laughs> Dress up. <laughs> and number two, we will test the seasonal rules by holding up different colours of cool and warm palettes. Okay. So... Now, the book's first recommended step is to swath your victim in a cloth of silver and then gold, and we should immediately recognize if she's a cool or warm person. Okay, here's silver. Now, I'm going to ask a series of questions. Feel free to scream your answers at the screen. Okay. Okay. Do your eyes shine? Hmm. Does your teeth look... No. Does, does your skin look smoother? Like a baby's bottom. <laughs> <laughs> Do your teeth appear whiter? Do your best features pop? I don't know what my best features are. <laughs> we'll let the audience okay. answer that in the comments. Okay. Now for the gold. Now for the gold. Okay. All right, here we go. I have to make myself look a little bit more attractive with gold. <laughs> Do your eyes shine? Check. Does your skin look smoother? Mmm, kissable. Do your teeth appear whiter? And do your best features <laughs> well, after that exhaustive examination, I think we can all agree that Andrea gives an overall impression of golden tones. Think angels and saints. Oh, that sounds nice. <laughs> so we'll slot her into the warm category. I like this colour. <laughs> well, okay. now for round two. Right. The seasonal rules. I'm going to ask a series of true and false questions and keep your answers coming. This is fun. I hope you're having fun. <laughs> all right. Winters are the only ones who can truly wear black and white close to their faces and still look and feel terrific. Okay, well, we've got white here, so here's Let's your see. autumn and summer representative. I'm feeling pretty fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> now black. Okay. Let's get rid of the colour so okay. we'll turn it around like this. So how are we? Heavy and drab. Still pretty fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> All right, moving right along. An autumn should never wear pink or grey. Okay. Well, there is this pink here that I know I look absolutely revolting in and I don't like the colour. So there. It should make my skin look a little bit greyer. Again, we'll let the audience I should look judge. tighter. <laughs> <laughs> How about grey? Grey. Okay. Mm, I've seen better. Next up, a summer should never wear any shade of orange. Okay, this is going to be fun. Well, here's one of my favourite dresses that I regularly <laughs> wear. <laughs> yes, but you look gorgeous anyway. But oh. you might notice that it doesn't make her pop. But maybe if you pop too much, people would just be blown over. This makes me pop. <laughs> <laughs> here's a bright orange. 
Let's have a look. I think bright orange suits me. Yes, well, Andrea, it is an autumn. <laughs> well, it's more spring, it's a spring, isn't it? actually. But have a look at this colour. Mm -hmm. This should show. Oh, I love this colour. Please say yes. <laughs> All right. Okay. A spring should never wear any shade of pink. So I'm saying I'm a spring, aren't I? Yes. Well, I can't wear this pink, but I can wear coral pink. Okay. We'll anyway. move right along. Every season can wear purple. Well, true. And I have a special purple blazer here. The purple people eaters. <laughs> I don't know where that came from. <laughs> okay. Okay. So now it's time for the third and final round. Right. The birthday gift. Now, okay. Andrea, mm -hmm. I do on this one occasion happen to agree with you that as you have become older, you have also gotten more youthful. Have I? So I thought I would, Silly, perhaps. <laughs> I thought I'd buy you the appropriate birthday gift. Oh. I call it the spring chicken dress. Oh, Go and put it on. Thank you. Okay, this is exciting. So hang around. I'll be back in a second. Here's my beautiful dress. I feel like Cinderella. Thank you, you so Cinderella. much. <laughs> it is absolutely gorgeous. This is actually an Australian company. They do vintage style dresses. It's called Kitten de Moor. And I'm going to show you a close up of the skirt because it's not uh, chickens. It's actually yellow canaries, but they are so gorgeous with little roses. So, <laughs> well, thanks to the spring chicken dress, we can unequivocally, positively say that Andrea has in fact become a spring. And while we're at it, and it's her birthday, let's just give her all four seasons. Because <laughs> I'm pretty sure she's going to look fabulous in her new primrose, which nearly covers the entire yearly palette. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> okay, I do want to emphasize that we are really only having fun here. And we both strongly believe that you should wear whatever color makes you happy or gives you great pleasure to look at. <laughs> Even though I do hop around between the, se the seasons, I probably do stick with the warm colors. But one advantage of that is that everything in my wardrobe does go together. I can literally go to my wardrobe with my eyes shut, randomly pull out a couple of clothes and they'll go together. And sometimes I've actually put colors together that I would normally never think of putting together and I've really liked the results. You actually do that? Occasionally, I have. <laughs> I've put some colours together. That's how I first put a certain purple and a certain red together. I just put them together. Oh, wow, that looks great. With your eyes closed. Yeah. I'll try it sometime. <laughs> <laughs> but it all has to be cool colours or okay. warm colours. Anyway, <clears throat> let's go back to the woman in our lives who started all of this hoo-ha about colour theory, and that's our wonderful mother. So I recently went to Canberra to spend some time with mum and... I eventually convinced her that she should show off her hand knits on fruity knitting. So we went to the Australian National Botanical Gardens, which has a scientific collection of native plants <clears throat> from every single part of Australia. And we spent the day filming her knitwear. So, and I had to laugh because just like you've taken a shine to Kim Hargrave's designs, <clears throat> Mum's taken a shine to Carol Feller's designs. And when I said to her, why have you knitted so many Carol Feller designs? She said, well, actually, I first of all just picked one because she's Irish and mum's father who died in the war when she was just two is Irish. <clears throat> so she's got a soft spot for the Irish. And then she said they were so well written and she got some fantastic pattern support from Carol when she got stuck at a, a tricky spot. And she also really loves Carol's yarn. So that is an authentic endorsement for Carol Feller's yarns and patterns. And if you want to know more about Carol Feller, we interviewed her back in episode 80. And mum recently turned 80 and we think she looks fantastic in her knitwear. So I hope you enjoy meeting mum in her knitwear. And straight after that, we're going to Copenhagen to meet Stephanie Rasmussen in Knitters of the World. L is for the way you look at me O is for the only one I see V is very, very extraordinary E is even more than anyone that you adore can love 
is all that I can give to you. Love is more than just a game for two. Two in love can make it. Take my heart and please don't break it. Love was made for me and you. L is for the way you look at me. O is for the only one I see. V is very, very extraordinary. E is even more than anyone that you adore. Can love is all that I can give. To you, love is more than just a game for two. Two in love can make it. Take my heart and please don't break it. Love was made for me and you. Is for the way you look at me. O is for the only one I see. V is very, very extraordinary. E is even more than anyone that you adore can love. Is all that I can give to you. Love. Is more than just a game for two. Two in love can make it. Take my heart and please don't break it. Love was made for me and you. Love was made for me and you. Love was made for me and you. from Copenhagen, Denmark, and I do vintage knitting. I've been knitting on off since I was 10 years old. My mom taught me and she's been knitting forever, so I just wanted to try what she did, but I never really managed to finish anything because my patience wasn't there. So yeah, been knitting on off, but never really finished anything until I started to dress in vintage style clothing around six years ago. Um, I primarily dress in 1940s dresses and in the beginning I just bought the original vintage pieces and wore them and quite quickly after that I started to sew my own dresses like this one and that all led into also knitting accessories and knitting cardigans and stuff like that because Original vintage pieces from the 1940s are difficult to come by and knit knitwear from the 1940s are more or less impossible to find. So I just started making my own. I primarily use uh, original um, patterns from the 1940s um, and alter if need be. This one 
is the first piece I actually managed to finish. Um, I'm very proud of it, mostly because I actually managed to finish it, but also because this pattern wasn't a cardigan pattern in the beginning. It was a standard top with short sleeves, so I thought it could be cute as a cardigan, so I altered the pattern to be so. And that is how I go about most of my knitting. I take elements from patterns I see and mash them up and combine them in the ways I want them to look. So I have a base pattern and then I add elements from several other patterns onto that base pattern. So I get um, something that looks exactly how I want it to. So yeah, first, pa first pattern, first finished project, very proud of it. Um, most of the things I do make are from um, our cardigans, but I also do make things that people don't usually see, like this tiny 1940s underwear set. It's based on several patterns I found on the internet from the 1940s. It has a tiny top with a pair of matching knickers. They do not look very cute like this, but they are actually very cute when worn. It's made from um, a soft merino wool, um, so it will keep me nice and warm during the cold Danish winters. Can recommend making a set like this if you do wear venture style clothing. It's so nice. So usually I use vintage patterns because that is the style I'm going for, but if I find a 1940s style pattern, modern 1940s style pattern or 1930s style pattern, I will definitely use that. And uh, this is an example of this, of that. It's a um, modern pattern from Sandness and it just has that 1930s look with very long tight sleeves. It's a huge elegant puff sleeve um, spilling out over the sleeves. It looks quite ridiculous with these long sleeves, but the trick is they're going all the way up and then the sleeve spills out over it. Um, I did some alterations on this one as well because it was quite boxy, a very modern boxy fit. So I um, made the body tight but kept the sleeve shape. So again, take I take what I find aesthetically pleasing and then alter it so it matches everything else I wear. Even though I mostly knit tops, blouses, cardigans, I do actually also uh, make uh, make a lot of tiny accessories. I don't, don't use them that often or you don't see me using them that often, but uh, last winter I found the cutest 1940s knitting pattern for a pixie hood. So I made two. They are knit from two pieces uh, in a brioche stitch and it's just a very simple hood. Um, it was a style that was worn a lot by young women in the 1940s. Today I think people would call it a child's cap, but um, it goes well with the, the 1940s hairstyles even though my hair isn't that uh, vintagey today, but it just fits the hairstyles. It looks very, very cute, if I um, have to say so myself, and it um, goes with the rest of my wardrobe and keeps my ears warm when I ride the bike for work or to work. So yeah, 1940s pixie hood. It took me a weekend to make, so it wasn't a difficult project, but a fun little project. But most of my things look like this a very nine basic for the 1940s uh, top with the um, waist length body fitted sleeves with a bit of bit of puff in it i am trying to be better to use more than one color uh, i have a tendency to just knit in in one plain color and that's it this was uh, i made this last summer in a cotton it was uh, not something that my hands were very happy about, so I'm definitely not going to use 100% cotton again, but um, I really, really like this one. It's very fresh, very sporty, and um, 
I went a bit out of my comfort zone with actually using more, more than one color. So this is definitely something I want to work on in the future, being better to um, incorporate different colors in one piece. And hopefully I will um, try out Intasha or Fair Isle Knit um, at one point, uh, because now I just have to get used to actually matching colors and make them look um, good together. But yeah. Proud of this one as well because it is uh, actually my first piece with more than one color. One girl has set the whole town crazy. One girl and she's a little daisy. One girl with golden hair and a great big baby stare. One girl has got the fellows lonesome for her company. She's got a sweet little smile, a neat little style, and she belongs to me. And everyone in town loves my girl, loves my girl, she's my girl. But every day I hear some fellow say, our eyes have met, our lips not yet, but oh, you kid, I'll get you yet. And that's the reason why I worry my poor brains in the world. For if ever I should lose her, show me one man who'd refuse her, for everybody loves my girl. Welcome back and thank you Stephanie for showing us your impressive wardrobe. You look absolutely fabulous in your homemade vintage garments and vintage clothes. Actually we're being a little bit naughty here because we have no right to label anybody else but we both think that Stephanie looks like the epitome of a colour me beautiful winter and all the clothes that she was wearing just happened to be winter clothes. <laughs> It's remarkable how many vintage outfits she's made for herself. Yeah. From sewing all those dresses and skirts and high-waisted pants yeah. to knitting that cute little vintage underwear set. Yeah. I particularly love her puff sleeves on that silver grey top that she wore with the little lace dicky. <laughs> Collar, you mean. Yeah. Yeah, she looked gorgeous in it. So it takes many hours of work to produce a content rich show and fruity knitting is only possible through the financial support of patrons. So please do support the show by becoming a patron. There is a live link in the description box below and you can pick your level of support. So we really thank you for doing that. And we're particularly grateful to all of the wonderful patrons who have kept the show going so far. Now recently we had a live event for our Shetland patrons with the Tasmanian sheep farmer and yarn producer Nan Bray from White Gum Wool and we featured White Gum Wool in our Meet the Shepherdess segment back in episode 68 and Nan is a 70 year old woman who farms alone and she has an amazing story. So Nan had a career as an oceanographer before becoming a farmer and the sheep on her farm now live in a single large intergenerational flock and she's basing her farming principles on the land conservational ethics of Aldo Leopold and the pioneering research into learned animal behaviour and nutritional wisdom by the scientist Fred Provincer. So it's a totally fascinating live event and the audio podcast of the event is now available for Shetland and Merino patrons to listen to. And Nan is offering Fruity Knitting patrons a 20% discount on all her yarns from her online store. And White Gum Wool averages 17 microns, so it sits right in the super fine range and can easily be worn next to the skin. So I highly recommend going back and watching the feature on White Gum Wool in episode 68. And patrons also listening to the audio podcast because Nan's story is so unique and inspirational. And now we're back in under construction with me. And last year after I'd finished the Devote, I must have been anticipating this very moment where I would be knitting my first cabled garment. Because after binge watching old episodes of Fruity Knitting, I decided to knit the Windy Scarf by Martin Story. I really enjoyed episode 72, which featured Martin as the main interview guest. And I knew that Andrea had created a tutorial on the scarf, so I thought it would be the perfect way to teach myself cables. 
So I show you how to cable with and without a cable needle in the tutorial and it's a great tutorial for advanced beginners who want to learn how to cable and for intermediate knitters who would just like to cable without a cable needle. As you can see, I haven't even completed a quarter of the scarf, which means it's not high on my list of priorities. <laughs> and we can safely say this is an intrinsically motivated project. It's also a project you that- You can I, make it into a cow. I know, but I feel like I, I need to finish it. Okay, okay. <laughs> but it's also a project I started on a whim because where I'm from, there's not much need for a scarf. A jumper, yes, but a scarf is overkill. <laughs> So just this once, I'll allow myself to be labelled a process knitter over a project knitter. And I've used the yarn's recommended wool, which is the Rowan Pure Wool Superwash Worsted. And I've purposely chosen the fairly clashing colours of a warm baby pink with a cool lilac. Because when you place warm and cool together, it tends to make the colours pop, which is another tip I learnt from Fruity Knitting. That means when we sit together, we should pop. <laughs> and now it's time to give you an update on my cabling adventure it's called the tailor it's from kim hargrave's four book and let me show you a picture of the design to refresh your memory it's a jumper with splendidly draped sleeves and is knitted in pieces from the bottom up the pattern recommends the rowan pebble island but i've substituted with the deririm natura gilead this yarn appears to be the perfect substitute because of its high stitch definition and the color I've chosen is called Aster and it's nearly a complete color match to the original. Only mine's yeah. a little more purple, perfect for summer, blue based. <laughs> <laughs> and most importantly, my stitch gauge is actually on point. So there's lots of points to celebrate about my knitting this time round. Okay, grab so, your glasses. Okay, here we go. <laughs> and cheers. cheers. First off, I've been keeping a closer eye on my knitting and I've been checking for mistakes that are recognizable at the end of each row because I can't afford to be ripping back anymore. Now that I'm a cabler, it would be a nightmare to rip back and have to try to place each individual stitch in its correct position back onto the needle. So now when I do make a mistake, I'm patiently back picking each row. So you're checking every row? Yes. That's good. Something must have shifted in my psychology because my three-year-old daughter, Leia, her yes. <laughs> latest fantasy play is to grab a swatch and pretend she's fixing mistakes. Yeah, it's so cute. She does this daily, which is very diligent, and you can hear her muttering, eight mistakes, yep, I've made eight mistakes, as if it's some kind of achievement. Yeah, it's so cute. <laughs> now, back to the cabling business. With all this cabling and chart reading, I've actually given myself a rapid fire lesson in learning to read my own knitting. So I can now perform surgery on a miscrossed cable, or I can ladder down and fix any knit stitch, which was supposed to be a pearl stitch with my trusty crochet hook. So what well was done. once a cross-eyed head scratcher has now become a magical port key, transporting me to a whole new realm of knitting, and that's something worth drinking to. <laughs> it is. Cheers. Okay. <laughs> now, Andrea, I have to say that despite your doubts, my color-coded cabling chart is working like a dream. All I have to do is casually glance over it and I know which special abbreviation to look up. <laughs> <laughs> to look up, mind you. <laughs> not to read. <laughs> I'm not there yet. <laughs> now, being the type of personality that I am, there's nothing that I would love more than to have brought you this project as a finished jumper in, it, uh, in Bring and Brag. Yeah, with a little film. Yes, that would be <laughs> nice for memory's sake. But now that I'm a cabler, it is somewhat <laughs> satisfying watching my knitting grow and the pattern unfold. It nearly makes up for the slow progress time. Here's the other bit. Yeah. It's not just that that I've completed, but... She's doing very well. With my new change in attitude I think perhaps I don't need a further 24 sessions on the fruity knitting couch up yeah I know your your attitude has improved remarkably <laughs> and your skills okay well now it's time for our feature interview with the UK designer Sarah Hatton which I know you're all looking forward to as I said Sarah has a wealth of technical knowledge and she also gives some fantastic tips on how to modify your garment <laughs> so 
Enjoy that. And Sarah is also kindly offering Fruity Knitting patrons a 25% discount off all her self-published patterns in her Ravelry store, and she's got hundreds to choose from. So enjoy looking through her collection. So thank you for spending time with us again. I hope you've had a little bit of fun and a few laughs. And stick around for the end to see the water fairies. Yes, right at the end, the gorgeous Simba and Leia, a little update on their knitting. And next time, I'll see you with Madeline back in Germany. So cheers. Cheers. And happy knitting. Knitting. We are slowly making our way up north in the UK and today we're in Sheffield. With me is the designer Sarah Hatton who some of you will recognise as being one of the main Rowan designers over the last few years. But Sarah is now working freelance designing for various magazines and yarn companies and she also works as a pattern writer for other designers. And like many professionally trained designers, Sarah's output is prolific. She did well over 1,000 designs just for the British yarn company Serda before even joining the design team at Rowan. I've knit a couple of her designs and I'd describe them as being fun and stylish, the kind of garments that most knitters would really enjoy having in their wardrobe. So that's one of the reasons that I'm really thrilled that you agreed to be featured on Fruity Knitting. Thank you for asking me and thank you for knitting my garments. <laughs> <laughs> they were a pleasure. So uh, you've got a really interesting story of how you were trained. First you studied fashion at Breton Hall College in Yorkshire. Yes. And then you worked for the British Yarn Company, Serda, who gave you a very thorough old school training. Yes. So what aspects of the formal study and your time at CERDA were most useful to you? And I definitely want you to say a few of the details that you told me about your <laughs> thorough old school training because I found it fascinating. <laughs> um, okay, so um, I, dis I did a degree in fashion at Bretton Hall College, which is an arts college but um, is now West Yorkshire Sculpture Park. Um, so I lived on the grounds there. So it was very inspirational countryside. Um, and I think that helped me a lot, but I didn't really like the sewing. And it turns out that on that particular course, the sewing and the tailoring was a really important part of okay. the course. So my meditation to relax from the stress of all that was to do hand knitting, which I'd always done as a child. So it was a real kind of escape. Yeah. Um, and I got sponsored for my final degree by Serda. So they gave me yarn and I did four or five pieces um, and then after that they asked me if I wanted to go and work there and it just seemed like the perfect opportunity. Obviously everyone else on my course, because we're talking about, I think I graduated in the year 2000, a lot of people thought it was a slightly crazy choice to do hand okay. knitting because yeah. we're talking about when everyone was wearing like fleeces and lots of sportswear, um, but I'm so glad I did, yeah. So tell us now about the training, because as soon as you got there, they didn't get you straight into designing. They sort of wanted to make sure your basis was really thorough. Didn't yes, they? yes. So I think I'm really lucky um, in terms of that I I was probably the last person to have that really old school kind of formal training in, in hand knitting. I don't think companies do that anymore. So I think I was very lucky to hit it at the right time. Um, but we were quite formally trained. You had to achieve tension on every yarn before you were allowed to do anything else. So there was the first period I was there, it was a lot of sitting in silence, just knitting tension squares of every yarn. Um, so and the row gauge is really important. Yes. So I used to knit 
what we would call southern knitting, like loose like this. Um, and I had to relearn how to knit because they liked everyone to become like a pit knitter, like a um, Scottish knitter. Um, so I had to learn that first and then get all my tensions and you, there was a very particular way of holding your hands and things. So that Can was you a show us? Yeah. No pressure, I'll be really slow now. So, <laughs> <laughs> so they wanted, they thought it was a really good way to achieve tension, but it's also a really fast way to knit. So um, we all did a time trial in the office and the lady next to me won the world's fastest knitter that year. So I guess if you are producing as many designs as we were there, it's kind of handy to have a room full of ladies that can speed knit. So it's where one of your needles is balanced under your arm. And the idea is that your thumb shouldn't really move too far away from that needle. Mm -hmm. And then you're shuffling your stitches with the other hand. Yeah, so this is like this is literally a shuffle, the left hand needle. It's just going. Yeah, I kind of think forth. it makes you more like um, a human knitting machine. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, so you can see why you can pick up the speed with it. But um, yeah, like at the time, and I you're hated doing pearl them. now. She's doing pearl. onto pearl stitches, which I know a lot of people hate, but I don't mind. It's pretty. That's sort of similar to how I knit, except for the right hand needle is even more stable, which is good. You're not, it's like using a knitting belt. You're not actually holding the weight of the needle in your yes. right hand. Yes. And that means that you are kind of faster for sure. But it is, does also mean that the pearl and the knit stitch is very similar, which also would help you have a very even gauge. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, they were keen on you working on that because of the row gauge, which I know for a lot of people is a bit of an issue. It can be up and down. If you aren't comfortable suddenly swapping to a whole new style of knitting, what I tend to say to people, it tends to be cotton yarns that it happens in particularly, but change your needle size. So on my knit rows, I'd be working on, say, a four millimetre. And on my pearl row, I'd be on a 3.75 because it's normally your pearl row That'd actually that forms longer. So just by going down that needle size tends to even those out. Some people get it on every yarn, some people get it on some yarns. It doesn't mean you're a terrible knitter and I think that's, a lot of people worry about that and it isn't, it's just how you hold your yarn. But for you, they would get you to practice swatches on a DK weight yarn and make sure that you got their recommended gauge. Yeah, you got it on every single weight. Yes. Yeah. That, that's extraordinary. Okay, so then after you got your knitting down pat, yeah. what was the next step? So from there, they were very keen for all designers to understand the pattern writing process, which I think really informs my design style. Um, and I think I can normally pick out when I look at designers who knows how to write a pattern and who doesn't know how to write a pattern. Um, so we went through different styles of patterns and you'd be writing not just one size at a time. I have always written graded patterns so you'd be working on five or ten sizes at a time um, and I think that really helps you as a designer to think of how all the bits of a garment fit together because if you don't it's very easy to do a beautiful sketch and then when you come to the pattern writer because it's normally someone else who has to do it for you um, they reach a point and they're like I can't make that thing happen so as I'm designing I'm like mentally knitting it and thinking like oh yeah how's the sleeve going to fit into that and is it in going to interrupt the pattern and how would I make the pattern flow around that so I think it's helped me as a designer a lot um but it just turns out I'm a maths nerd and I really liked it and at school I hated maths so I think yeah it it's, it's the maths applying to knitting yes but you told me also that you had to sit in sort of single desks in a way yes. and they would come by and they'd give you a pattern and, and tell you to it's like almost like a, an exercise and you had to prove yes. yourself on yes. being able to grade that really well yep. and then they'd give you a, a step up yep and yeah so it was uh, desks in rows we worked in silence at the end of the day you covered your desk with a cloth um, to, so that no sunlight affected your garments or your work so it was really precise and at the time I didn't necessarily enjoy it that much because that's quite strict, but it's put me into really good stead now, you know, like... I really good habits. Yeah, and I, so I'm really glad that I stuck yeah. with it because there were some other girls that left fairly quickly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so finishing was really important too. What did they teach you about finishing? Yeah, so they had a very particular way how they liked things finishing and we always did a uh, mattress stitch or ladder stitch, some people call mm -hmm. it, but only ever taking half a stitch. So it's a teeny tiny seam, so it's really, really neat and it just looks like a knit stitch. Um, and then... When it came to sleeves, I know some people use that for side seams. And then when it comes to sewing in sleeves, 
we'll revert back to back stitch. Mm-hmm. But we did almost like a variation on mattress stitch where you would pin your sleeve in place and sew it from the outside because obviously that's the bit people are looking at so you'd be able to line up your stitches really neatly. Okay. And I love making up, so they put me in good practice, I yeah. think. <laughs> I think once you know how to do it well, there's a pleasure in it. But if you're yeah. always fearful about, oh, this is the, the area that I don't think I'm going to achieve a good result on, yes. then you're not going to like it. Yeah. yeah, and also that, like, I've just spent this many hours knitting a thing. Am I going to spoil it by not finishing it correctly? And I want people to learn to embrace it as part of the process. Yeah. I think the other thing is everyone leaves the making up right till the end. So you've cast off and you're like... <gasps> I really want to wear this. I'm so excited. But then I've got however many hours of making up. So if that's a thing, why not do your side seams once you've done your front and the back? Then you can try it on and it fits okay. When you've done a sleeve, do it. So the bit where everyone else is crying because they have the making up to do, you've only got like half an hour to sew in the last sleeve. So yeah. cheat yeah. if you need to. <laughs> yeah, just as, as you go along. Yeah. Now what about your time at Rowan? Were there any designers there who particularly influenced you? Oh, like um, when I finally got the job at Rowan, it was like landing in heaven. It. I mean, I suspect that's for every knitter. That's the dream job. Um, so I got to work with Martin Story and Kim Hargreaves, who are both real design influences on me. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was just absolute heaven. Yeah. yeah. Cloud nine. <laughs> and and what about photo shoots and things like that? What did you? So I had done photo shoots at Serdar, but obviously their aesthetic's very different. Mm-hmm. And we were also on um, every day of the photo shoot, you would be doing maybe 26 shots, which is a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, and Rowan really liked that idea of storytelling. And so slowing down and how it all pieced together. And I really enjoy, as a designer, I like working on a big collection, how all the pieces fit together and what's the story I'm telling and am I doing something for every knitter and can each knitter see themselves in it I think that storytelling was a really big part of Rowan when I joined and it was wonderful to do yes I mean that's one of the reasons why people buy those magazines also is just to see the beauty of it yes see exactly the way the garments are portrayed with the atmosphere and, yes yeah. so like getting the chance to do that was amazing yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. So you were directing all of the models and the and the lighting. Yes. And... So each designer at that point in time was taking a story from them. You would be given a, a story to do, and you'd be thinking right from the outset: how, uh, where am I thinking of photographing this? What's my model looking like? So you were visualizing really, really early on how you were going to tell the story before that, you even sent the brief. Before the... you sent the brief, or personally, I did because I think it was important that yeah. it fit, every part of it fitted together. Um, and then it would go out to the designers and we'd they'd get them sent back and then as a team we selected um so there might be a hundred designs and we'd have to select it down to the st- how many we could fit in the magazine so obviously there was quite a lot of um oh well like it's only a little piece so maybe it's half a design so we were always trying to sneak more in because we'd had so many beautiful designs in um, i can imagine that yeah, would be really hard it's, it's impossible <laughs> Okay, so can you now show us a selection of your designs yeah. and through them just describe your design aesthetic? Okay, so I think it's really hard to describe my own aesthetic. Other people can see it more than I can. Maybe I'm too close. Um, but when I'm designing, I like to think of the pro- The process is as important as the finished garment for me. I think there's no point designing the world's most beautiful knitted garment if every row that you knit is just painful, painful. And, you, yeah, and you hate it and you're using your bad knitting words and that's not what I want. I want you to love every minute that you're knitting it and then have something lovely at the end. So okay. that's quite important. So for example, this piece here, um, I knew I wanted to really go overboard with the cables. So it was very important that I charted these cables and then I was working out where I could squidge even more cables in because I wanted okay. it to be really, really intricate. So it kind of grows up and then as you reach the top the cables change but I wanted it to be quite organic in its movement of cables but then again it's in grey which is my favourite colour so it's quite simple and quite elegant but as a knitter there's something to really get your teeth into okay so as a designer I think I maybe it's that middle ground between um something really timeless and elegant but that there's something just to get your teeth into okay and mainly just single colours yeah, I don't really... Do, I mean, I really admire people like Marie Wallen. I think her colour work is stunning, but I, I just... It doesn't set my 
little knitting world of flame it doesn't do it for me so sorry anyone who loves colour uh, knitting but it's just so, not mine well everyone has their own forte don't they exactly and I think that's the other thing to teach knitters it, you don't have to love every bit of knitting you just have to love the bit you're doing you yes. know if you only ever want to knit socks in the rest of your life as long as you love every minute of it yeah. do it it doesn't yeah. matter so yeah and over time your tastes actually do change yes yeah. 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 So this here you can see it very easily the way it sort of just migrates here very naturally, yeah. isn't it? So it was these bits that I charted first. Um I'm quite keen I like charting my own stitches rather than using books. So okay, so you make this. up this yes. your own. That, yeah. That's yeah. quite unique because a lot of designers just simply go to Yeah, no, I love sort. my graph paper. Oh, good for you. <laughs> Thank you. That's really that's a skill in itself. Yeah, but again, I think that comes back to having that formal training of pattern writing. Yeah. When you're pattern writing, or certainly it was then, I think we had one computer in the office that we shared. <laughs> That's oh. how long ago it was. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it was just a pencil and a piece of graph paper, charting everything out. So I think that's probably why I love it. But yeah, so I did these and then I was like, don't like these big empty gaps in between yeah. so how am I going to fit them in yeah and then that kind of traveled up here so yeah, yes and so this little cable here is that little cable there. yeah he kind of repeats on the yeah. way up that's lovely do you remember what this one's called I would have to check is it a Rowan design it's a Rowan design okay. yes okay yeah. well I can put the name on the screen later so, so it's a hooded lovely cardigan with a satin sleeve yeah. okay. it's my you know when you feel a bit poorly and you just want to cosy up because it's got no buttons or anything. It's a proper wrap around, mm. you know, like a Jedi mm. coat. Mm. Good. <laughs> okay, so show us some more designs. So this is, um, again, grey, sorry. But I really, really like um, very simple tailoring details. So, for example, on the raglan, it would have been really straightforward to do the shaping right at the edge of the work. Mm -hmm. But I think there's a real elegance to just setting it in and showing how you're working. It also makes making up a lot easier. So mm. I like adding those little details. I think it's quite feminine, but not over the top. It's not um, fussy or mm. overcomplicated. There's something to get your teeth into knitting down here, but then there's some nice TV knitting. Um, and then just that repeated thing. So I love lace, but I don't like overly fussy lace. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, it's a technique I enjoy doing. Okay, and it's plain on the background. Plain and, on the back, yeah. And a little bit of lace on the sleeves. Yes. Is this a Rowan design as well? No, it's not. It was done for the Knitter magazine, but it's okay. available on my Ravelry page. Okay. Um, but yeah, it's just that kind of... And I also think it's very adaptable in terms of if you only wanted very simple lace, you could cut pa panels out. You don't have to go as, as lacy as yeah. I have. Yeah. So yeah, I like um, simple calm pieces <laughs> okay so show us what else you have because you've got some gorgeous things there thank you now a lot of your designs you don't have the garments for do you because i they... don't sadly no they all the magazines um, get to keep them so this is something that i worked on for rowan um quite a few years ago now but it's in a standard four ply weight i really like dk and four ply because you get that stitch definition it's not too chunky that it's awkward mm. to knit this is so elegant and beautiful. How is that created? Thank you. So that was um, a farewell for people like me that don't do colour work. <laughs> so an, an easy one? Or... An easy one. So okay. it's all, it's kind of cheap farewell, I think. Um, there's only one colour on each row and they are just slipped stitches and pulled yeah. stitches. So everything's explained within the pattern, but yeah. I do kind of use these slipped stitches quite a lot in my work. Yeah, that's very beautiful. I love the way you've used the darker purple up here um, as contrast to this purple it just looks so elegant thank you yeah so, lovely okay and then again and I guess this is the kind of reoccurring theme that I do things that are quite um tailored and elegant but have got like one little quirky detail mm -hmm. that makes it a bit different so this um again is an old piece for Rowan but it's in a DK weight but it's a linen blend so with linens you always get that beautiful drape to it and I think this shape works really well for that. So it's just a V-neck with one button, because again, buttonholes I know are a thing that people sometimes don't like doing. Um, and then it was in Irish moss stitch with a cable up the front, and then the cable just echoed down the sleeve but came into this flared section. So again, it could have been very traditional and stayed by just having the texture, mm. but by having that flare at the bottom, it just made it a little bit different. It does. It makes it really elegant. Like you could, like the way she's been modeling it, you could easily wear it to a very, like a wedding or a really high occasion. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So I think it's just the getting that comes something with a little bit of silk or drape or linen mm. to kind of get that shape to work really well. Yeah. That's beautiful. Okay. And 
This one, even though you say you don't like colour or fair owl much, this one I think is a stunning, stunning design. It's, it came out in the Rowan magazine number 60. And yeah, so tell us about this one. So I can do colour. Yeah, yeah, I know you <laughs> when can. When I need to. Um, but for me, I, don't, I didn't want to throw every colour at it. I think a lot of people, of all the techniques, fair owl seems the one that scares people the most. So I wanted to keep it really simple, just two colours um, and quite graphic so there was that simplicity to it rather than it being too much for people. Mm. Um, and so that's about as much colour work as I do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think it's beautiful. Now, is that done in the round or is it done in pieces? No, Rowan tend, at this point in time, I know they now do do work in the round, but um, they like to see in pieces. Okay. On the whole, I guess maybe because I don't do colour work, I do like working seamed pieces just because I think it adds structure yeah. to garments. Yeah. So I do do pieces in the round, but my go-to method is that it's a seamed piece. Yeah. yeah, okay. Okay, so that's a good sort of... It shows that you can do all of these styles, even though you have a preference to, to maybe cables and lace. Yes. You still do fantastic fair art designs. So yeah, your, your you. training's all there. Yes, it's, and yeah. I think that's the thing. Like, um, So when I was at Serdar... It would be one day they'd say, oh, you've got to do a dog coat. Now, I mean, maybe dog coats are someone's cup of tea as a designer, but yeah. um, that's a challenge. Yeah. That's not something I'm comfortable with. So I think being a commercial designer, I've always had to be thrown at something and you've got to kind of find a way to be comfortable with it. And in way, I, I kind of like the challenge quite often of, oh, I didn't think I'd be doing this. Exactly. You know? So it's. Yeah. I think you get the best out of a designer when somebody pushes them in a yes. direction where they're not quite comfortable. Yeah. Because it's amazing what comes out. If you leave them alone to do only what they want to do, sometimes it's a little more repetitive. Yes. You know, you need somebody to poke them. A yeah, bit and I really and like that. And yeah. I like the kind of, um, it sounds a bit crazy but that moment where you get the thing and you're like I can't do this I can't do this I can't do this and then you've got to take a moment and think oh okay how do I move this into my comfort zone but still keep what they want me to achieve mm. so yeah I love that mm, that's great okay well Sarah has really deep technical knowledge particularly in pattern writing and um the hardest place, most of us know this, for to, to get a garment to fit perfectly is around the upper torso. So that's the armholes and, and the shoulders and the neckline and across the chest. So what are the pros and cons of the different sweater shapes as yes. to their fit, their wearability and how easy they are to modify? And I just want to give an example because... Some, some women might have really broad shoulders and be quite flat chested, so they can't just easily pick a size, uh, a pattern size based on their chest measurements because yes. it won't fit the shoulders. And the same is, is true for the opposite, a narrow woman, uh, a narrow shouldered woman with a, a large bust. And some sweater shapes are e much easier to modify. Yeah, very much so. So what's your advice? So my advice would be, first of all, when you pick the size that you make, I think most people um, end, to end up going for a bigger size than they really need. Mm -hmm. um, so always look at the information that's in the pattern as to how much allowance the garment has because one designer, if you designed a sweater, you might like a 10-inch allowance, but mm -hmm. I like a 4-inch allowance. Mm -hmm. That's our aesthetic but it doesn't mean it's the final customer's aesthetic. Mm. So measure a garment that is your perfect garment that you wear at home, whether it's hand knit or bought, bought yeah. and then compare that to the measurements that they are giving the pattern. Not the two fit size, 10, 12, yeah. 32, 34, yeah. but the actual garment measurements, because I'm willing to bet most people will be like, oh, that's why I knit everything too big and it doesn't fit me and it's not flattering. It's because they're going on the size that the designer wants rather than how they want to wear it. So mm. that's my first um, thing. And then it's about, like you said, picking the right shape garment to alter. Yeah, mm -hmm. definitely. So for example, the raglan that you have there. Okay, I'll hold it up. And Raglans can... are beautiful and elegant and very flattering with those lines. But in terms of altering them, it's one for the more technical knitter because... The rows in the garment and the sleeve have to match exactly. exactly. Yeah. And you've got to account for the fact that you've got this little drop here. So it's quite a technical alter. And if I would be encouraging people to buy anything, I mean, obviously buy as much yarn as you want. I can't judge you on that. Buy a graph pad 
because it will change the way you knit a lot. Okay, so explain yeah. that a bit more. So I my biggest tool in knitting world is like my school graph pad. Uh, I um, love your old school. I'm really old school too. <laughs> I'm very happy with a pencil and a piece of Me paper. Too. I don't need computers. Um, and so if each pattern will tell you the row tension and the stitch tension, which gives you something to play with on, on the pattern that you have been given. So if they are telling you there are 96 stitches across the shoulders, mm -hmm. you can then work out how much that is in measurements and start comparing things. And if you're going to alter things, I'd rather people did it on a piece of paper and played around with this than I'll just cast on and everything will be fine. Okay, so... On a piece of paper, you, you you can literally divide this up for stitches and rows. Yes, exactly, you? exactly. So obviously, I use this really fine gauge, but you can get it bigger. Um, you don't necessarily need knitter's graph paper. That's more if we're going to draw a picture of a Coca Cola bottle on a sweater yeah. or something, because okay. that's to do with proportions. Yeah. This is just straightforward math. So, for example, here I'm working out how many increases should be on a sleeve, or how many um, stitches take up the pattern. But playing on a piece of graph paper, even though the when you first try it, it's going to seem weird and a bit back to schooly, and quite often you can't really picture how the stitches relate to this. Mm -hmm. But getting comfortable with this and even looking at a pattern and charting how they have done a sleeve shaping is going to change how you knit and how you understand your knitting beyond measure, like rather than yeah. the actual... I know we all love the actual process of knitting, yeah. but this changes things so much. Yes, I can I can believe that. And so, for example, if, if we take the narrow-shouldered woman, she might actually want the measurements of a small around the, yes. around this part. Yes. But she wants but and, she and also here, body. but down here yes. she suddenly needs yes. the large. Yes. Yeah. So there I would be drawing like um the shaping up here of I've got 20 stitches. How am I going to get rid of them to make a nice shape? And that's why if you take some patterns that you have at home and just have a go at how they've done the shaping, I think you'll get a sense of how they've created that lovely curve that you can then copy, mm. but to your measurements. Yes. You know, it's not as magical as you think. Oh, it, it, you know, it's not what... It's like... <laughs> <laughs> I know, I shouldn't say that. But sometimes if you see a jazz musician, they're just making everything up and you think, my God, that is so extraordinary. Yeah. But they're really playing around with scales and arpeggios. Yes. And once you know those scales and arpeggios, it takes a bit of the magic out. There still is magic, but there's technique is just like a key. It's like yeah. learning a language. Exactly, yeah. and that's what this is learning. And it's you've got to start thinking of your... I think people think of a garment and a design as a whole and then get really overwhelmed. Oh, my God, I can't imagine mm. how you do that. Well, let's face it, even on this, that's one square. Mm. Everyone can do a square. Mm. A square's not hard. Mm. Then how do I get from square one to square two, which is the narrow bit at the top? Well, that's where I have to do this tiny bit of shaping. Yeah. But with those two squares and that tiny bit of maths is all it takes to make the front of a garment. So I think it's breaking it down to points that you can handle and not get overwhelmed by but this isn't beyond people yeah okay so basically a raglan sleeve is if you've got a sort of unusual shaping that you need to modify to make it fit you perfectly you're not so experienced maybe, not go maybe don't go for raglan, raglan sleeve at first so yes. what's a set in sleeve so is... a set in sleeve is probably my favorite style mm -hmm. of garment anyway just because i think like you said it is more flattering mm -hmm. um but also that thing, I think the biggest modification most people want to make is making it narrower across the shoulders than in the body. Yes. Most garments, they'll yes. say, oh, it always falls off my shoulders. Yeah. Well, there it would just be that I'm going to do some more decreases at the bottom of the armhole. And even if you did them and they didn't look great, it's under your armhole. No mm. one can see that. <laughs> so... I think this is the perfect shape for altering into and getting and to the right shape. To and alter. learning, yes. Yeah. And then all we have to bear in mind is the sleeve top. A lot of people will say, but it's shorter than the armhole. But it will be because we do all that lovely bell shaping to make it fit in. So the rule I tend to go by is that the depth of my armhole should be about 75% of my armhole depth on the body. Okay. And then by okay. the time I put all that shaping in, it should fit well. Okay. So that's a good one for people to kind of have at the back of your head. 75%. 
drawing on your graph paper yeah. and you should that's, get a so seventy. The, the sleeve cap, the length yeah. of the sleeve cap should be 75% of, of my the length of depth. the yeah. armhole So depth. I think yeah. it's like if this is about 19 or 20 centimetres, your arm, the top of your sleeve is going to be about 15. Yes. But a lot of people, um, so when I was at Rowan, we all used to do the pattern queries as well and that seems to come up quite a lot. Why are my things two different measurements? There must no. be a mistake with the pattern. There no. isn't. It's because we've got all this shaping happening at the top of the sleeve that we've got to fit into the body. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. this is a good one to modify. And, you know, if you wanted to make it flared, that's a really straightforward one. Again, with the graph paper, how long is this? How many rows is that? Where do I place each of the decreases or increases to make your shape happen? But like I said, as long as you break down the piece into little squares mm. it shouldn't be too overwhelming yeah okay now you've got a couple of other you've got the drop shoulder there and that's really yeah. you can do all, a whole lot of different shapes in in the drop shoulder it doesn't have to be the 80s no and I think people are avoiding it because we remember the bad yeah. 80s sweater both of us who are old enough <laughs> <laughs> um, but it doesn't have to be that way um, in terms of they were very big kind of allowances on them yeah. and they were very long they were almost yeah. like sweater dresses but now I think we're going for, it might have an allowance, but it's more cropped so you can yeah. see the body underneath it. Yeah. But the problem always seems to be where you have your sleeve joining, your sleeves are quite wide yeah. to fit into the armhole depth, but you get kind of like a, a wadge of fabric yes. under your sleeve, which yes. isn't the most flattering. Um, so what I tend to do is I'll make my sleeve like a little bit narrower mm -hmm. and then I will add almost a sleeve cap but it's not really all I'm doing is instead of casting off everything in one go like mm -hmm. um, an 80s yeah. drop shoulder I'm just going to do it over maybe eight rows and it's just encouraging more fabric at the top where it needs to stretch across my shoulders but less in my armpit where it looks yes. really messy and awkward so okay. again a really easy one so if you think of a sleeve that's been knitted flat this is its sleeve you've just got a very slight bell curve yes. on the top yeah I mean it doesn't yeah. seem like Maybe it's going to do like... a great deal to, to the garment but it will just give it a little bit more of an elegant touch and mm -hmm. like I said there's nothing worse than having bulky fabric and especially if you're conscious about the size of your bust or mm -hmm. your body shape I just think that's a more elegant way of doing it. Okay and another typical uh, inquiry that people have is how I've got large upper arms and I need to do a, a wider sleeve than, than their shoulder measurements yes. or something so how can that be done here? So again, there, this is quite a simple one because again, we go back to graph paper, <laughs> always graph paper. I would be marking out the how many rows I've got in my sleeve mm -hmm. and then I'm going to be adding more increases. So the pattern may have 15 and I need to make mine 20, but it's putting little dots on your graph paper mm -hmm. really evenly to get that kind of nice shape because there's nothing worse than having all your shaping here and then a big straight bit. That's not yes. very flattering either. Yeah, or even, or likewise, if you have most of your bulk of your weight up here, increase more rapidly up yes. here. Yeah. yeah. So that graph paper, although it seems a really silly way to work, I'd rather people spend time playing with graph paper than casting something on, finish it and going oh what do I do with this it doesn't it doesn't seem like I thought it would be in my head yeah this way it, there's not as much knitting but the knitting that we're doing really really counts yes that's true and you also said to me sometime before that often people aren't reading patterns correctly or there's more information inside a pattern than what they know yes exactly and I think that's um we all there's and there's nothing wrong with just following the pattern mm. nobody's mm. judging if that's what you want to do mm. that's fine but um, on the pattern, if it the sleeve tells you that it's 80 stitches wide and we know what the stitch tension is, we can work out how many that is in centimetres. So although that little kind of diagram might not give you the very schematic, much information, yeah, yeah. it's all there, but you've just got to be a bit Sherlock Holmes and work it out from it's this many rows, how many, you know, how many centimetres does that equate? So it's working backwards and forwards between stitches and centimetres. And row counts. And row yeah. counts, yeah. And again... If you are one of those people whose row count is a bit out, maybe don't go for the top down or the raglan. Whereas the set in sleeve, most pattern writers, these are the patterns where it says continue until work measures. Yes, so yeah, exactly. Not do yes. so, uh, so many count of, exactly. of rows, but um, make sure you measure to 20 centimetres. Yeah, and yeah. as a pattern writer, when we're writing those patterns, 
we're always making sure that all the shaping happens quite a way before that, even on a sleeve. So there's that like, either slow down or catch up, do what you need to do, but we're all gonna reach this number of centimeters rather than rows. Yeah. Very good, okay. <laughs> Okay, now you have recently designed a couple of collections for the West Yorkshire Spinners. Yes. That's right, I say spinnery, which is wrong, <laughs> spinners. And the Riverside collection uses the Blue Faced Lester yes. yarn. So can you show us a few of those designs? I will do. The yarn is beautiful. Um, so it's a standard DK weight. It's Blue Faced Lester. So it's the softest of all the sheep that we have here in the UK. Yeah. And it's got this beautiful kind of sheen to it that hopefully you can see on the garment. And they did eight colours that are quite rich and jewel-like. So we did two collections and this is quite a different feel. Um, and on the collection when I was designing, I wanted it to have that kind of timeless elegance. The mood boards that we were doing were very feminine. So hopefully I've managed to tailor the line between pieces that people will wear and that kind of femininity. How many in, in the whole collection? So eight colours, eight designs. Great. Okay, so this first one. So again, it, this is probably the most feminine piece, but it's just a very simple lace on the sleeves. And then this echoes in this front edge. And then it's just got a really simple tie detail. So quite a modern shape, but with some lace and then plenty of TV knitting. <sighs> this is DK weight. It is a DK weight, yes. Okay, great. Okay, so show us another so then... design. So on this piece, I wanted to keep this really elegant power down the middle. It's quite flattering to just have the stocking stitch. And then I'm mildly obsessed with this kind of bud stitch. Um, I think it's really effective, but you are just making some stitches and taking them away again. But we kept this as a drop shoulder, so you're just thinking about this rather than shaping into it and how all the stitches happen. So really good kind of move on from a basic garment, I think. Yeah, that's beautiful. And that's got that shoulder with all the slightly Yeah, my capped. teeny tiny yeah. shoulder shapings in Beautiful. there. So this piece in the brochure we have done, and I know it's maybe an old fashioned way of writing patterns, but people love variations on things. So this we did a more fashionable slip over, which there's a lots in the shops at the moment, but we also offered a classic sweater as well. So again, it's that cables that I love, but maybe slightly more unusual cables. And then on the trims, we've just done them like a folded back trim to kind of make it a little bit more modern, but a really nice layering piece, I think. It's very beautiful. And an amazing colour. <laughs> just show the back the same. Yes. So definitely one for those that love cables, but I don't think these cables come up very often, so it's nice this, to see a bit different. This is a really interesting cable. You've got a big loop and a little yeah. loop. Yeah. Is this one that you made up? Yeah. <laughs> She's clever. <laughs> <laughs> Just that's um, beautiful. That's really the graph a lot. Thank you. Yeah, no, I just thought that was a maybe more elegant way of it mirror, and I love that kind of symmetry mirroring out, which I think most cable designers love. Yes, I've never seen that cable before. Thank you. Well done. I'm sure someone else has done it. There's nothing new out there. <laughs> so on this one, it was really all about the color, which I just think is glorious. So I didn't really want to mess around with it. I just wanted to show the color, which is kind of a little bit mild and that just perfect lime green. So um, it's mostly stocking stitch and then it's just got these little details on the um, raglans and then that's mirrored again in the turtleneck. But really very, very straightforward and it is just sewing in those sleeves neatly, I think. So there's three little tiny, almost like twisted stitch cables, like just going Yes, yeah, so I think it's referred to Rick on. Rack, you know, like the Rick Rack lace. Yes. And it's yeah. just a case, if you don't even need a cable needle, um, you can just swap the placement of the stitches, but it's just that tiny little effect rather than anything too complicated. And again on the back. Yeah. yeah. So this yarn is so beautiful, you can easily get away with it just doing stocking stitch in it because yes. of the heathery effect. Yeah, and I think building collections, this is what I love about them, that you're doing the simple pieces for someone, then you're doing the challenge for someone, different price points. I really love that kind of building a whole collection together. Okay, well, it's been fantastic to have you on Fruity Knitting. We've just got one more question, yes. and that is, are there any areas in knitting or areas related to knitting that you feel like you haven't fully explored to your full satisfaction. Just spending time with more knitters. <laughs> yeah. And I think maybe we're all feeling this in lockdown, that yeah. really missing that sitting down with someone and sharing a passion. And I think people think that because we're 
doing this for a living, we don't necessarily share the passion or we don't learn. And every time you meet a new knitter, mm. you're like, how did you do this thing? Yeah. I love this thing. So I really miss that interaction and I hope that starts again soon. But also... I like teaching people to push themselves slightly, not too far, mm. but just a little bit. So I'm looking forward to kind of more things like this piece here, which is for the black sheep um, knit along that we did. And okay. each square, this was one of those challenging projects to design. I really wanted each square to teach something to the knitter, but still fit together as a, as a piece. So we did bubbles without turning your work and cables and ah so, yeah. okay so just tell very quickly tell us a few of the techniques you've got so here. we have got these no turn bubbles here so that means that you've always got the right side working yes and, yes and you do the which the, i think most people hate with bubbles that you're turning like three stitches so many times it's a nightmare so this you're just slipping them backwards onto the other needle knitting them and backwards and forwards while the work's facing you but it also means they are Slightly perter. Uh, <laughs> uh, bubbles. Pert bubbles. Um, mosaic knitting, which I know is a big thing for a lot of people. Yes. yes. Um, and then this square here, I wrote so it is done as either a seam square or worked in the round. So it was that first kind of like, come on, everyone, you've heard of Magic Loop. And honestly, it's really not that hard. And you can do one little square and then hopefully they'd be encouraged to move on to the next thing. So I like the challenge of teaching and making it aesthetically pleasing as well. So, yeah, there's Wonderful. another one in the pipeline. Oh, really? Yes. Okay. And did you say this is a free pattern? It is, yes. Okay, on Ravelry. Uh, yeah, so it's, if you go to the Black Sheep website, yeah. um, there are tutorial videos mm -hmm. with the wonderful Lynn Rose. She's teaching you all the techniques. Yeah. Oh, look, we've just got to move it across. We have to show this okay. one here. This is very interesting. Sorry about this. Maybe if you hold it like that, there it should be in the camera. So you've got a panel of cables yes. with stripes around. That's gorgeous. Yes. And people hate picking up stitches. So this is a perfect way. Instead of doing a whole button band... Everyone can do 10 centimetres. Yeah, that's great. Well, you know, it's been really great to have you on Fruity Knitting. You're such a, a book of knowledge. <laughs> Thank you. I think we have to definitely do another interview of some sort in the future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. Um, Good. I've done this a long time. <laughs> yeah, you have, and you've been really well trained. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, well, thanks, thanks again, and let's say goodbye to the audience. Yeah, goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.